good evening, everybody. This is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our virtual events. And this evening, we're very excited to have uh, Fabian Niciesa. Close enough? In Espanol, muy bien, yes. Claro. Um, here at the end of what I'm sure is a very exciting and exhausting publication date to, to launch his brand new book, Suburban Dicks. And uh, Fabian was nice enough to sign an, a whole batch of copies. I really love your stylized signature. That's very cool. Thank you. <laughs> it, it, uh, it's been my comic book autograph for 30 plus years, and I've tried to keep consistent with it. That's awesome. Um, but for those of you watching, I'm going to be monitoring the Facebook uh, comments. So if you have questions for Fabian, go ahead and put them in, and I will reemerge towards the end of the program to ask some of those questions. And Barbara is, is uh, sitting there from her home office, and uh, she's, she'll be doing the interview tonight. So I'll go into the darkness. I Thank love you, it. It's Shakespearean. <laughs> you know, off he goes. Like, but we had a we had a conversation whether he was more like Caliban than Ariel. But you know, it's a kind of Shakespearean tempest thing. Um, it's really wonderful that we have autographed copies of this. Now, I have to say that of all the Poison Pen staff, I am probably the least qualified to be talking to Fabian, not Fabian. I want to call him Fabian because it's the Spanish thing. But Fabian, he says, is what he's used to having left Argentina at the age of four and gone through the American school system. In any case, I am not, I am not wise in the way of comic books, even though, let me tell you, that as a child in Winnetka, Illinois, when I got my allowance, I would get on my bike and I would pedal up to the five and dime. I mean, we're talking the 1940s here. And I would spend my allowance every week on comic books. I absolutely love them, you know, whether it was Superman or Batman or Wonder Woman or, you know, various other characters. And do you remember or did you ever run across Fabian something called the Little Big Books? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, well, my I, uncle, my uncle, bless him, when he went off to war, World War II, had left behind a huge box of little big books that were the delight of his childhood. So I read my way through Flash Gordon and the evil Emperor Ming and all of that. You know, those little books had fabulous they illustrations. They, they, were, they yep. were a book comic, right? Yep, yep. Oh. And, and um, the, the, I discovered them after I discovered comic books here. Uh, when we came here in, in 1966, my, my, my brother, my older brother, uh, and I recognized Batman and Superman, simple as that, on the racks. We recognized the comic books from the TV shows we'd been watching in Argentina. And, and it was actually the 50s Superman show um, and the 1940s Batman serials that were running in, in, on television in Argentina. And my brother recognized them immediately, so he asked my parents if we can get the comics. And, and you know, I was only four and a half going on five and and you know so whatever he wanted to do is what we ended up doing um and, and we and my parents said okay fine because they weren't that expensive and we certainly didn't have a lot of money when we came here and, and we just started to learn how to read and write by by reading comic books and my brother and i both drew so we really easily and naturally kind of gravitated towards them um and and i read them i kept reading them my whole life it was never an obsessive Kind of a collection thing. I just enjoyed them, and they were they were they were just good for the imagination, is what it amounted to. Um, and it made me realize, probably by the time I was around 10, 11 years old, that I'd love the chance, the opportunity to become a writer one day, because I loved the idea of creating stories. Well, um, graphic novels are kind of a thing at the moment, although comic books are going. But um, I forgot to drink a toast to you on your publication. Thank you very much. My apologies. I appreciate it. Right, our, our events are usually BYOB, but Fabian at the end of a tiring day is just drinking water, but not my problem. I'm drinking <laughs> it's nine fifteen my time. No, my my, Barbara, my wife, my wife and my daughter threw me a surprise sort of like um, uh, appetizer thing, and and there was champagne and there was bourbon, and they they dude it up the porch, the screened in porch we have with congratulations and things, and I didn't even know they were doing it, because um, because I, I was upstairs doing an interview at the time, so we had a little bit of champagne and bourbon earlier, so I decided 9.15 my time, but I'm going to stick with the water for now. I love that. My husband, who I'm happy to tell you is my resident chef, is out in the kitchen putting together a bourbon maple pecan chicken dish. And yeah, I, that sounds um, fantastic. Well, 
it'll either be really good or be really wretched. I don't have any idea, but he loves to create things. So I was also going to tell you, talking about childhood memories, that um, my grandparents lived across the street from the guy who, and I'm trying to remember whether, I used to remember this better. He either drew Dick Tracy or he wrote Dick Tracy. Milton Gould, I think, was the wasn't he the creator of Dick Tracy? Do I have that Chester, right? Chester Gould. Chester, Chester Gould. Gould. Chester yeah. Gould, yes. And I can't right? remember, I really can't remember which one it was, whether it was Chester or the guy. But anyway, you know, they had all that cool technology and so forth. And I can remember when I was like, you know, in elementary school, that I would think about two-ray, two-way wristwatches. You know, mm -hmm. because we could go over there, there would be the panels drawing and there would be all this cool tech stuff. And who knew that in point of fact, all of it was going to come true. Um, yeah. and, and I've always found that so interesting that the things that people put in comic books and in science fiction, to a great degree, have really happened. Um, yes. You know, yeah. It's almost, um, you know, tapping in to the future. Now, I, I looked up your biography in Wikipedia, so I can introduce you. And I was exhausted after <laughs> I read about 14 paragraphs there. <laughs> but what I did learn from this, aside from the fact that you came from Argentina at the age of four and lived in New Jersey, went to school in New Jersey, which might be the reason that Suburban Dicks is a book that I describe as like Harlan Coben on steroids, because, oh, -ho, it is suburban New Jersey. Anyway, if anybody would regard the the politics and the shifts in publishing with a calm eye, it would be you because your career has been marked by perfectly astonishing shifts, um, you know, in and out of corporate stuff. Um, and, and you've gone freelance. I, I lost count of how many times, you know, you rose to some prominence in something or other, mostly to do with, uh, well, actually you work for your current publisher, Putnam Berkeley back, what was it, in the 80s or something? 1983 to 1985, I worked right. at Berkeley Publishing. And a lot of a lot of new authors, because amazingly, despite all of the work that you have done, this is your first novel as compared to comic book or screenplay or whatever else you've been writing. Um, a lot of new authors are completely thrown by um, publishing politics, but if anybody <laughs> was well positioned to just dance across that tightrope, it's certainly going to be you looking at your career. I, so you uh, must have I, had I, a really good time, you know, and, and a lot of confidence in yourself because, you know, to leave an actual salary job and go freelance as often as you have, um, what does that say about you? Does it say you're- Sometimes it wasn't, <laughs> sometimes it wasn't my choice. Um, ah, that's that, what I'm saying. I, I, I I loved working at Berkeley Putnam. It, it was a really good company and a really good group of people there. I was there for two years. And if it hadn't been for the fact that an opportunity uh, presented itself to get a job at Marvel Comics, I probably would have stayed at Putnam and Berkeley longer. Um, but, but because Marvel Comics, there was a job opening that I could apply for, and it's a company I'd wanted to work for since I was 10 years old. Um, I, I went and got the job at Marvel and, and, and moved up within the ranks at Marvel. Um, I started selling my writing as an employee of Marvel. You just did, you did your, your comic book writing freelance, not in the office. The office was for your office job. And my office job was advertising manager, uh, which is what I went to college for, public relations and advertising. So I did all of Marvel's advertising for them in their comic books, the, the retail stores, the uh, direct market the, um, shops. And, and I did promo posters and house ads and co-op ads and all of that stuff. Um, so, so I was really kind of my DNA was less as a writer and more as an administrative staff guy. And I loved it. I loved the job. I loved I was in my 20s going into my early 30s and I loved working on staff. Um, and I switched from advertising manager to editorial only because I needed a change. I'd done one for five years and I ended up being an editor for about four years. And I asked to be an editor of anything but the kind of comics I was writing. So I was writing superhero stuff and I ended up editing Barbie comics, William Shatner's Tech World, Ren and Stimpy based on a Nickelodeon cartoon, Alf. Uh, I did some movie adaptations for Marvel, like the Hook movie adaptation that Spielberg had directed. So I did that on purpose because I wanted a diversity of experience. And, and, and it was great. It was, it was not easy because license books are real tough to do. 
um, but it was a great experience because I, I learned a lot. I met a lot of people um, outside of, of the comic book box, you know? Um, so so I, I always liked it. I always liked bouncing back and forth. But not, not now, I guess I think now, now those days are kind of over. Um, but, but even as recently as a few years ago, I'd be going into, the, into New York. I, I call, always call it the city, sorry, into Manhattan um, a, a couple days a week to work with a company in Manhattan called Starlight Runner Entertainment. And we did uh, story world development for Hollywood studios and toy companies and video game companies. I've been doing that as a freelancer with them for almost 20 years. And it was a way to get me out of the house and get me into the city, which, which I always like to do. Um, so so I, I lost the aspirations to be a, a publisher and editor in chief, all of that. I lost that a long time ago uh, as, as I got older, but I still like the idea of an office environment and that kind of, that kind of interaction and teamwork and socialization. Well, I brought it up because um... The, the Suburban Dicks is not your ordinary debut novel. Um, it has a lot of features that I think must arise from your past experience. I'm always interested. I mean, we love debut writers. We live to host events for debut authors because, I mean, and I, I can certainly attest to it that if, if we get you at the outset, we, we get you, you know, we get to keep <laughs> you. So um, it, nurturing our, our career and, you know, promoting new voices is a very big thing with us. Although we are also faithful forever to, you know, to others that we have longstanding relationships with, but you always have to start somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's exciting uh, to be able to do this with you. Um, and your book um, has a, an interesting quality to it in that um, it's set in suburban New Jersey um and your your heroine um your protagonist shall we say comes on the stage and you think what's with this woman she's phenomenally pregnant it must be she has four other kids so you know she's like a baby machine and she stops in this um in the in the crime scene as it all turns out because one of the kids really has to pee now that's not your conventional opening so why is it that you were so, um, why did you decide to start the book that way? I mean, I think it's fascinating. Um, I, 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 you know, I had, I've had, honestly, I've had the opening of the book for, in my mind for so long. I, I've tried to put it on paper a few times and wasn't happy with it. So the original genesis of it was simply a way for me to introduce in, in a kind of an, a, a unique way in a visually different way for me to introduce the protagonist of the book um, in, in, in all of the, the reality of her, both, especially both sides of her, the side that she has to live with every single day, the minivan with four kids and a fifth on the way, the, the extra seatbelt strap that now needs an extra seatbelt strap so she can get it around her stomach, um, combined with the opportunity for her in, in, in a split second to realize that the minute she walks away from the van and steps into a crime scene, she's actually in her element. And, and, and no offense to, to moms, none of us would be here without them. But but for her, her true self is in, in solving crimes. And, and she has not been her true self for the last 10 years of her life. And she's only 33. So it was an opportunity, I thought, right off the bat to introduce the reality of the character and the dream of the character at the same time. Um, and, well, and then right. it was a matter of finding the language to make it work. Well, sure. But you've, you, the key word in that whole discussion right there was visual. And that's what I was going back to was to say that because you have come, you know, from, um, you know, Deadpool, X-Men, the comic book world and so forth, as a writer, you're going to be more visual. Um, in the way that you want to present the story. So I'm not surprised that you didn't create an arresting scene in order, as you say, to show us the two sides of this woman. Now, when she steps into a crime scene, she is not totally without experience, right? 
No, she 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 was a criminal justice major in college. She had uh, cracked and helped solve a major serial killer case when she was in college. She'd actually ended up working with the FBI in New York City while she was a student at Columbia. Uh, we, we only kind of hint a little bit about some of that backstory. Uh, she'd also solved a crime while she was in high school, which was um, the, the a, a high school girl from a nearby town in South Brunswick who'd been missing for 20 something years and 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 Andrea found her her remains and then ended up um, finding out who the killer was um, and she did that when she was in high school but it was a much smaller local story that didn't get the attention that the, the serial killer in, in Manhattan that she got helped capture uh, that got her a tremendous amount of attention at that time um, but but when she was ready to graduate college and she was um, planning to go to Quantico, um, she ended up she ended up getting pregnant and and decided that she was going to keep the child and 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 the man who impregnated her her, her boyfriend Jeff uh, you know um, proposed to her so they ended up getting married and that just took her in a different direction than the one that she was planning to go. In. So having gotten pregnant by accident, um, by unintentionally pregnant, let's put it that way, and marrying the father, um, why does she compound that by having all these other children? Because really with one child, she could have continued on, um, you know, in the, in the direction that she was going with her career. But once she was continually pregnant, and now with five, um, that would be difficult. So if this is a kind of um, moment where she has an opportunity to conceivably reboot part of her life and bring them together. Why did she decide to give her all these children? Did you just want her to have like a long layoff? Um, well, hopefully the contract I signed with Putnam was a two book contract, Barbara. So you'll get a lot of those in season book three. Um, the, the, the truth of the matter is, is that the she allowed her life choices to, to take, take herself out of the equation. She allowed the fact that, that she had one and then was pregnant with a second and then had a second and we became pregnant with a third. Uh, she kept asking her husband to get a vasectomy and he just refused to do it. It, it, it speaks to some inherent uh, issues that she has. Uh, I, I, had no real interest in writing superhero. Uh, I've written enough of those. I, I wanted to write people that that had flaws and people that 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 had internal conflicts and had made mistakes. Uh, I just found it more interesting. Um, at, at the time that Andrea was conceived, she was kind of a, a an amalgam of several friends in my life, um, and it was a time in our lives when we were all getting married, getting our first houses, you know, or townhouses, we're starting to have our first kids and our second kids, all of that, that happens to so many of us, roughly 29 and 34, you know, um, and that, that's kind of the age she is, because that's roughly about the age I was when I originally came up with the entire concept, and and several of my friends were, were struggling with the decision as to whether to go back to work or be, be you know, a stay-at-home mom, the decision to whether a second kid or third kid, that had, how to overcome a miscarriage, all of those things were happening to, to me and my wife, my friend group. Excuse me. Bless you. And, you. and and all of that ended up informing her. And what, what happened is that because it took me so long to find confidence, frankly, to write the book and to be satisfied with my own prose writing, I outgrew the character by 20 years, you know? <laughs> so I can look back on her now, having had 20 years of experience, positive, negative, you know, things I'm really happy about and things that, that, that are recriminations and, and infuse her current status quo at age 33 with a, a foresight that I didn't have back then, you know? Because now I know where her life is gonna go. Now I know the choices she's gonna make. And I know how, how she got herself into that place and how she's going to kind of get herself out of that place. I, I kind of have that all in my mind for how I want to continue to evolve the character. Um, but, but all that being said, that she's well aware of, of the mistakes that she's made 
although she would never call any of her children mistakes. You know what I mean? That it's that it's that eternal conflict we have. You know, be, be, especially women um, who who are incredibly educated, incredibly capable, and and either have to or or willingly leave their career. Um, and then having having listened to all my friends and talked to them about how they feel about that 20 years later, how they feel having left the job they had or having left the career they had. And, and, and some of those regrets and, and, and recriminations within the context of the fact that you have your kids and you love your kids and you raise your kids, you know? Not, not well, easy. I wasn't, I wasn't being judgmental at all. I was just curious. Not at all. In that, you know, it's a different ball game, as I say, if you're a person with one child, um, yes. Which, which a single adult can manage. But once you go to two children, it's almost impossible for one adult to wrangle two kids. And when you take it up to four or five, then it becomes a necessary team effort. So yes. you, know, you have to have a husband who's on board or the whole thing falls apart, or you have to have you know, other resident relatives or uh, neighbors who are suffering from grandparent withdrawal or whatever. And if you're gonna have a person investigating a crime, this comes up a lot. Um, and it came up in the 90s a lot in the women's sleuth movement about whether any of these women, um, because that was the whole private eye movement, you know, that mm -hmm. was propelled by Marsha Muller and Sarah Paresky and Sue Grafton and all. Um, if you had children, how much danger might you incur to them? But the larger question is if you were constantly running into danger, who would pick up the pieces if something happened to you? and take care of your children. So it becomes a risk aversion problem. Um, and I was interested that, um, you know, that, that you've given her all these kids because if she's thrusting herself into danger, which in fact she does um, in suburban dicks, then that's a, that's a really tough question to answer. You know, who will take care of my kids if something happens to me when they are so young and, you know, in so many. And, and it's true of men too. I mean, it's the same problem for dads, you know, if they have a number of kids, you know, um, how, you know, are they going to be firefighters? Are they going to be cops? Yep. Are they going to be, yeah. you know, going to be spies? You know, what is it they're going to do? But, but men seem to, you know, it's more normal, societally normal anyway, for men to be running risks, even if they have families, than it is for women to be running Risk. So we're, we're in an era where the most common word applied to women at the moment is agency. This is another of those buzzwords that really annoys me. But basically, it's saying, you know, um, empowering women to, to not only make their own choices, uh, but, but to accomplish things without, um, without male support, so to speak. So, you know, what you're saying is that she she was all set to go in one direction, then she got pregnant, then she went another direction, maybe went farther in it than she might have. And now all of a sudden you have given her by the simple act of her driving her van into a place and opening the door so her kid can leap out and pee, you've plunged her into a crime scene and here she is. She's going to get to make some choices that um, up until that moment really haven't occurred to her. Yeah. and. And once once she starts the process, I I tried very hard to to make her stubborn about needing to to see the process through. Um, she she's quite confident that that she can handle threats and she can handle potential danger, mostly because she doesn't pursue through the course of the book. For the most part, that that she's in any real threat or in any real danger. Um, I I I I made a rule for myself when I started the book, um, which was myself for my comic book roots, uh, and, and and a little a little thing I wrote down, and it was uh, it was no tights, no flights, no fights. Um, I wanted to take the tropes that I existed under as a, as a superhero comic book writer off the table and, and allow the characters to move through a story where 
the potential for danger was there, but I wasn't going to have, you know, Andrea drawing a gun and, sh and getting in a firefight while she's eight months pregnant. And I wasn't going to have Kenny all of a sudden miraculously know how to fight, you know? Um, so it, I, 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 I meant, I meant to keep it that way because I wanted, uh, I wanted the conflict to come as much from internal sources uh, and, and their interactions with each other and with the, the world they live in, rather than than from external sources being being the 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 antagonists who have the gun or the antagonists who, who are going to physically threaten them. Um, and I have no clue whatsoever if that's if that was a risk or not. I have no idea whether it was the right choice or not. I just I just I wanted to write a different kind of story for me. And 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 it's so far it's resonated with the people who've read it because the closest thing we come to a car chase is a seventy-two-year-old guy who's trying to catch up to Kenny while he escapes in his Prius, and we don't even know if the gun was loaded because the seventy-two-year-old guy doesn't know if there's any bullets left in the gun. You know, so um, I, I kind of did that on on, on purpose because um, I wanted it to have a little bit more of a, of a soft ending when it came to the, the physicality. And, and the threat of violence. Oh, I think suburbia, you know, I mean, if you read guys like Linwood Barkley, or I've already mentioned Harlan, um, Joe Lansdale wrote a really interesting essay. Patrick's gonna be talking to him tomorrow night. And his new book is a standalone set in a small town in Texas. And, you know, he said, you know, small towns are are what he loves, you know, the the secrets, the, you know, the dynamics, the, you know. How much do your neighbors know about you? How successful are you in um, maintaining any kind of privacy? You know what happens when everybody knows your whole history and you can't, you know, you can't escape from it and all. And um, and so he likes that canvas. You know, so many crime novels are set in you know urban centers. I mean, you know, there are reams of them set in New York and Los Angeles and Boston and you know cities. Um, and a small town is a is a very different dynamic. Um, I mean, even Agatha Christie really liked villages more than she liked London, you know, to, to set her crime novels. So here you are in this um, suburban New Jersey. You're near, um, obviously, a, you know, major urban center, like across the river, but you're in New Jersey. And why wouldn't there be um, all kinds of things that, you know, hidden secrets, Maybe, you know, people behaving badly. Um, and I, I like the way that you worked your way through that in the book. Obviously, we can't talk about it, which is really too bad because it's- a Yeah, we can't give away. I know, <laughs> I'm, I know. I'm still trying, to, still trying to figure out how to talk about it without giving away. Well, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just, it's really tough when you're doing an event at the outset and you don't want to ruin it for the reader. How much do you tell them and how much do you conceal? But, um, you know, this is her life. She is not. She's not going to follow whatever is happening at the crime scene over to Brooklyn. I mean, she's got four kids. She's got a van. She's going to stay in her New Jersey. What is it called? West something here. I West Windsor. West West Windsor, New Jersey. West Windsor. Okay, so you know, she her life is in West Windsor. She can't easily get out of West Windsor. Windsor. So whatever's going to happen in the book is going to take place in West Windsor, but just because it's a suburb doesn't mean that it's not a microcosm of, you know, a much bigger, a much bigger area. Um, yeah, and the, the town itself, the area, the general area, it's, it's actually West Windsor, Plainsboro, which are kind of sister towns, and I've lived in both over the course of the last 30 years, um, and 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 they they've given up their secrets a couple times. Like you know, we we had a murder in Plainsboro just a year ago, uh, which was a bit of a stalking situation. It was a work related stalking situation. Um, we we had a missing girl um, who was uh, unfortunately the poor girl was I think she was around high school age and she was missing for a decade, two decades, and and, and they they found her remains literally like underneath an old mattress in the woods but not deep woods the woods really close to like main roads and everything 
And, and those things have happened in the area, but for the most part, uh, other, than, other than robberies, uh, which are relatively common, um, it, it's a relatively safe area to live in. We're, we're in the shadow of Princeton um, and, and Princeton University. We're nestled between like New Brunswick, New Jersey and Trenton, New Jersey, which are urban areas, but you know, New Brunswick has Rutgers University, which is where I went, and it's where one of my characters, Kenny, went to school. Uh, and and you know, we commute into New York. Most of the people who live in the area who work who work in, in the city just take a train and commute into, into the city by the thousands on a daily basis, you know. So we're exposed to things, but they're not so commonplace. It, and and one of my concerns actually even starting the, the the book as the idea of a series, and I got several ideas that I'd love to turn into books, but I also don't want it to become Angela Lansbury and murder she wrote where 180 people have been killed in Cabot Cove or whatever her town was. You know, yeah. you, you have to you have to be careful as to not um, is to not overplay that reality. So, so I've taken that into account in my mind about how not to um, how not to cheat theater by making it a little unbelievable. So, so if if we get a series out of this, future books will take place in some neighboring towns as well. The, the second book has quite a bit of activity in Manhattan, New York. Is the victim work there? So that's kind of Kenny's side of the story, having to deal with Manhattan, and Andrea's side of the story is having to deal with with the events here in, in the Windsor area. So you know, um, I'm trying to take that into account, but, you know, to, and still still have it fall under the category of suburban dicks. Got it. Well, I mean, you know, the anonymity that comes with city life means that keeping secrets are often not nearly as important as in a small town where there's actually more pressure, I think, on people to, you know, to keep secrets where families' reputations matter, you know, people are not moving around as much as in cities. But, I, you know, I, you're, listening to that reminded me, one of my favorite authors, David Rosenfeld, who really is a funny writer, his most interesting concept was that he had a guy who works in Manhattan <laughs> commuted to New Jersey. And so the crime took place in New Jersey, even though you thought when you started it, it was going to be in New York. I love the fact that he reversed, you know, the normal, yeah. the normal dynamic. But, you know, um, there are two things that we should really talk about. We've been sort of heavy here, but the point, you know, this is a really funny novel. I mean, everybody who reads it, everybody talks about it, um, really, really likes the humor, which, you know, arises out of the situations, but at the same time, you really do skewer prejudices. You have some amazing things fall out of people's mouths. Um, and so in a way, it, it reads, you know, you're stripping off mass uh, by putting some, some really horrendous, um, I'm trying to think what I want to say. You have people saying things that, that um, in the light of our particular woke culture at the moment are really mm -hmm. pretty shocking, but but they're just commonplace to the people who are saying them. And you know, and it reminds me of my parents and my grandparents because you know, if I listen to how they refer to people today, if I you know hear it in my head, you know, it's yeah. kind of horrifying. But but that was just common part. It's like reading Chandler. I mean, you know, you could read a a vulgarized Chandler, but if you go back and read, um, you know, those those early noir writers in the 20s and all the way they refer to people and all would be just totally unacceptable today. Well, I, yes, uh, and it's it's something that that you you have to you have to be very conscious of, and my approach in my writing for my entire career since I started, um, I, I've always manifested in the work a, a variety of characters that, that create what we today call diversity. But we didn't call it diversity in 1892. I don't think the word existed in 1992. Uh, you couldn't find it in the dictionary. And and I always did because I, I, I grew up a little bit in New York City. I grew up in, in a lower middle class area of New Jersey. Um, I, I, I'm an immigrant to this country. So I've always kind of skirted on the edge of being the other 
but never really quite being the other. Um, and, and it just, it made me conscious of it without often being overtly affected by it. And I live in a town right now, and I have lived in this area since 1988, um, and that, that was 30% Asian, the, 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 the community in the area, and it's now about 60 to 70% Asian. And I, I have been a part of watching that happen. And, and I know it bothers some people. It never bothered me because I left. Okay. Literally. And I, I drew a, a minivan as a soccer coach that had seven kids in it. And the seven kids were all from different cultural backgrounds, you know? And that was that was kind of West Virginia, Queensboro. And, and you know, the kids grew up without it being a real issue for them. It's the parents that have more problems. And, and, and quite frankly, we had kind of a rollover, a turnover of a lot of the original owners of the houses that came up in the farmlands were all Caucasian. And when it came time to sell, the buyers were all Asian. And they were Indian or they were Chinese or Korean or Pakistani. And that, that was who was buying a lot of the, the larger houses here. Um, and and it, it did definitely create a cultural turnover. It's, it's the, the Caucasians are a minority. And and to hear it, I listen to it. It's all sporadic conversations, but there's a bit in the book um, that, that that came from real life, which is the soccer parents that that, that the, the men clustered together, regardless of the culture, but the women were separated on the sideline watching the soccer game by culture. And I know this because myself. And my Asian American coach were on the other side of the field as coaches, and we looked across the line of parents, and we actually looked at each other. It's interesting, you know. No, no judgment, no anything. Just that's that's interesting, and and I just absorbed all of that. I absorbed listening to the kids chattering in the car. Talking about stuff going on in school and teachers they liked or didn't like, and and teachers who who were prejudiced, they you know the teachers were prejudiced against certain kinds of kids, and, and they would talk about it. So as such a commonplace sort of a of a frustration, but not not in in not not in a hurt way. It was more of you believe that guy is such a such a dope, you know. Um, and I, again, I just absorbed all of this stuff. So. Yes, it took me 25 years to write the book, but I'm, I'm in hindsight, I'm super glad it did because I think that that gave me a tremendous amount of kind of um, subconscious information to draw from um, and then try to put that in the book. And, and I try to give it some honesty, and I, but I always try to couch it in humor because you can sell a lot more with humor. You know, it, it, it's the it's the catching flies with honey rather than vinegar. So if you have cynical, sarcastic, fun humor, and you're an equal opportunity offender to everyone, you know, then 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 you can say more and and in quotation marks get away with more, and and that's hopefully when someone draws something out of it that, that it is a, a bit of a truth for them or a bit of a, an honest understanding that, that they may have been thinking the wrong way or they may have said something the wrong way or, or someone else may have said something to them and that and they reflect on it now and realize it. So if I can sneak all that stuff in there, it, it, it's it's almost organic to just the process of the characters interacting. Well, I think organic is a key word. I'm gonna, Patrick, come and join us because actually you're better qualified to lead this discussion that I am Hi, Patrick. I you were probably salivating yeah. over there in the dark going, wait. Welcome back, Patrick. <laughs> not at all. No, I've been enjoying so, the conversation. No, Pat, Patrick, Patrick when, when, you, when you're not on the on screen, does do the lights just go out where you are? Are you in complete utter darkness? <laughs> no, or do the no, lights? not oh, quite. Okay, because I was worried. I didn't think <laughs> <laughs> He's actually working on other stuff, but Patrick's a very talented editor, um, and he's um, he's a real um, student of noir fiction and noir humor and so forth. And and I don't call this noir, but nonetheless, what do you think, Patrick? Introducing humor into crime fiction is a real talent, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I I think it. You know, when it's done well, it's great. You know, and I like I like the idea of of a of the black humor, you know, a, a very dark kind of humor. Um, 
but yeah, you know, it's it's so humor is so subjective too. You know, what might be funny to one person isn't funny to the, the other person. So um, can you talk a little bit? I was going to ask you too. I, I also was reading about your about your bio, and I was it, it sounded to me like you really worked your way up in the comic business from the very bottom. Um, can you talk about how you kind of got started in at Marvel and other places? Um, yeah, I don't. I got. I, I thank you for uh, for, the, for the question. I, I've always felt that, that I didn't need to work hard in um, at Marvel to get where I got. I, I, I always felt I kind of cheated the the, the system of it work. Um, I I got a job at Marvel Comics in the Marvel Books Department in, uh, as an assistant in the manufacturing department. And Marvel Books was at that time was the hardcover books you could trade paperbacks you sell in the bookstore now the, the you know the compile multiple issues of a comic book into right, one. Um, right marvel books back then in 1985 was nothing really more than a licensing agreement with fisher price and we were doing activity books and sticker books and coloring books um but but i never wanted to be in manufacturing when it took the job to get my foot in the door at Marvel. yeah and, and and, and I betrayed the woman who hired me because four months after I started, an opportunity presented itself for the promotions department. And I, I applied for that and I got that job. I took a pay cut too to take that job. Um, and, and when you're entry level publishing, we all know that if you take a pay cut, that means you're going from less than nothing to less than less than nothing. Um, and, and I took the job because I wanted to work in the promotion and publicity department in Marvel because that's what I went to school for. And that's what I thought that I, I, could, I could help and excel at doing. Um, and at the same time as the guy who was hiring me to be his assistant had some big year above him to be a vice president in charge of the newly formed publicity and promotion department. And he took a year to figure out what the department was going to be. And then he named me advertising manager uh, by December of 1987. And then he just did my job. And it was through that job that I got to know the editors who do the buying of the, who, do, who hire the writers, the pencilers, the inkers, the letters, the colors. Um, and I started to sell what's called inventory stories. And those were self-contained completed issues that I could sit in a drawer, in a file drawer, waiting for the schedule to break down. Because it's more for publish. The schedule always breaks down. Because human beings having to draw 22 pages a month is physically really challenging to do it month after month. Um, so that inventory store would always be ready to pull out of the drawer the second you needed it, and you can plug it into the, into the schedule, into the production schedule. Wow. And, and gain yourself gain yourself 30 days by doing that. You know, um, and that's kind of how I made my bones. I sold a few inventory stories. But the reason I say that I don't too easy is because three inventory stories that I did, uh, the editor in chief at that time named me the monthly writer of a book. And, and, and I got a monthly comic book within six months of having sold my first story. And, and that, and sit here and pat myself on the back and say it's because I was so tremendously talented. It was just a combination of a lot of things going on at that time that got me that monthly book. And, and, and I wrote it for 16 issues until it got canceled. So in essence, my training ground was in monthly publishing work as a writer. That's what I'm starting to really figure out. But then, um, and, and then from there, a couple of years later, I started to write more and more successful superhero stuff. And then quickly from there, I, I was offered the X-Men assignments, which were the top seven books of the company at that time. But again, into that was multiple events overlapping each other that, that got me a lot. I have a feeling. I have a feeling you're being you're being humble here. Obviously, you had no. A I don't feeling. think I am because you're I, a natural. I, no. I, I, I said it before, and I'm more than happy to say it. And, and, and as the Fort and Van Hughes poison fan, I have always considered myself to be excellent in my mediocrity. I have always felt that I have been right there in the middle, shading up. And, and, and it's through hard work and through persistent excellence in that mediocrity that I've been able to maintain a 35-year career. It, it, I'm, I've never once been nominated for any kind of comic book industry award. 
and, right. and we're certainly at the point now where I would really question the values of any any organization that would choose to nominate me. Um, so so I, I've always I've always just been a hard worker, and, and I've always produced material that that met enough of the standards by which the audience and the editors were shooting for that they kept getting more work. You know, um, and and. That's, you know, when you get to be my age and you've been doing this as long as I have, and you have ups and downs and successes and failures, you, you have to you have to kind of take it all um, with a bit of a grain of salt. Understand that the roller coaster has to have some slow rises in order to give you the exciting, you know, uh, drops. You know, so so it, it's got to be a bit of everything. You know, it's fascinating because it seems like I've always been really interested in the the classic pulp era, you know, the pulp magazines of the, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, you know, before television came. And, um, you know, they had all this just wildly inventive and, and a writer, a, a good writer would follow the market and, and, and would write in the horror, the horror pulps, yeah. the Western yeah. pulps, the adventure pulps. And um, it seems like comics retain some of that spirit, which is really interesting. That that side of the marketplace. Would you agree, or is that? Yeah, no. I mean, the comics derive from the pulps. I mean, you know, the Batman, Superman, all of that derived from Rock Savage and, and Shadow and, and and the planetary stories and and, and strange stories and all of that. Um, I think that I think that what's happened though is that. that too long to define solely as a medium for the superhero genre. And that's because of the small comics had in the 1960s reinventing itself and reinventing its characters and Stanley and Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko and all of them. Um, and, and as a result, the only comics that were selling that were successful for the decades were superhero comics. Um, we're at a point now, which I find very fascinating, and that there's probably never been a greater amount of diversity of content in comics. From a genre standpoint, than there is today. Um, but there was comic content and material for just about everyone and anyone. But the superhero comics weren't selling as well as they were 20 or 30 years ago. Therefore, the perception is the comics are in trouble or failing. But the truth of the matter is, is that it, the content is just selling in different formats to different audiences than it sure. used to. Right, absolutely. That's really now, yeah, the evolution of it. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I read somewhere in your in your bio that um, you you know you're when you were a very small kid, you know you really learned to read and write with comics. Is that is that right? And so it's, it's just a, such a part of my, your DNA now, right? Yeah, my brother and I learned how to read and write English. Yeah, I, one of us were 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 left back a grade. He I started in first grade here in New York, and he started in fourth grade. We weren't left back. I, I honestly don't even remember much of my first grade in Queens, New York. I, I really, the memories don't really kick in until we moved to New Jersey uh, in 68 when I was entering second grade. And I think that's simply because I was learning the language. We came with no, 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 no English background at all. Um, my parents barely spoke any English when we came here. Um, so I think in that one year, I learned English. I learned how to read, write, and speak English. But my brain doesn't remember it. And literally, I just don't remember it. Um, and 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 I know that that being comics and the language of comics that was expanding at that time, the the, the language of Stanley and other writers were purposefully putting into their books because they also knew their audience was aging up a bit too. And they, they, all of a sudden, they had college students starting to read their books in the late sixties. Um, that they expanded the vocabulary enough. Um, and, and in many ways, always spun me off into, into other things. And Conan comic made me realize that Robert, you know, Robert E. Howard had written Conan as a pulp, you know, series back in, in the 30s. Or so, in Conan books. Yeah. Right. And, and that gravitated me to Doc Savage. So I started reading Doc Savage. And then sixth and eighth grade for me, middle school years, was this pathetic. Salt on Doc Savage <laughs> and Conan, um, and and and, and look, I was a kid. Little by little, I started to look for slightly more mature things. But you know, I also involved in my comics reading that way because as I got older, uh, into my into my college years, I wanted to keep reading comics, but I started to gravitate towards other things like Howard Shakin's American Flag, which was published by First Comics, which is a really kind of snarky, smart 
book. Um, I love your book. It's by the Hernandez brothers, which to this day is just a phenomenal comic. Two different storylines by each brother, um, and, and not a superhero really to be found in it. Um, and, and all that kind of stuff uh, always appealed to me. Um, even though I made my bones and I made my living in superhero films, I was always interested in, in, in other kinds of genres. And as a reader, I, I I would gravitate from you know, Stephen King to Jane Selway, and, and, and if you had a genre, um, I would just read things that, that interested me by writers. That interested me. Right, and, and you said you mentioned your brother. Is it Mariano? Yes, Mariano is my my brother. He's, he he's he like works twenty five thirty years older than me. <laughs> So you're like Lee and Todd Goldberg. That. Patrick, I have to say that he still has all his hair and he's three years older than me. So I always got to, I always got to give him a dig no matter what. But you work, he works in the same field, right? In, in uh, comics? Yes, he, he right, currently works for a, 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 a Dynamite Publishing uh, and he worked at Marvel for a little while, for years out of college, he worked in such Davis Publishing. Um, for, have you collaborated? We, not as players. Um, I've written things for him in, in an editorial capacity. Uh, he just asked me to write a project that he had been trying to develop for quite a while, which was uh, a Stan Lee's God Woke. It was a, a self-contained hardcover book that was an adaptation of a poem that Stan Lee wrote in the early 70s. So my brother asked me if I could adapt it with him, for for him, and I got to talk and work with Stan Lee in the latter years of his life when we were adapting that. That's um, cool. And it's a it's a it's an interesting poem because it stands the perception of, of what God would think about mankind if, if God came back. And it was Stan kind of you know Stan being serious Stan, and, and, and it was actually very smoothly written. It was fun to to try to adapt. Well, you know, it's interesting that your 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 previous life has dominated this whole conversation because it's been so so fast. Yes. Let me just say, well, we can't before, give away anything in the book. <laughs> no, well, I did. There is, I did, I did let you down in one respect. This book is called Suburban Dicks. Notice, dicks plural. So we've mentioned Andrea Stern, the very pregnant mother of four, former FBI profiler who stumbles upon a crime scene and realizes that there is something wrong at the crime scene and that the cops are not really giving it their all. But we didn't talk about Kenny Lee because to have a plural, we have to have two suburban. Yeah, have two suburban and days. Kenny, Kenny, like Andrea, had you know a great thing going and then got derailed um, by Bad reporting. I mean, he made stuff up or whatever. Bad was. choices. Yes. A little so bit he, of a mirror. A, a little mirror. To another bit. Too. So he's gotten busted back to you know to working in a in suburban New Jersey as a journalist, and so the two of them come together, and you know they balance each other out, but they form this investigative team to try, try to figure out, um, and that's that's how the investigation proceeds because there really is a a crime, more than one, and an investigation in the book. And, you know, all of the humor and all the rest of it arises from, from all of that. So I felt like we needed to mention Kenny um, because it takes two of them in yeah. order to and, and, Andrew is kind of an over, overwhelming presence. I, I, and I knew that, I, I knew that all along and I get that, but, but I, I think that Kenny's there and necessary he is necessary. Yeah, out, absolutely. You know, yeah. but but because and it, because he also has access to avenues that she doesn't have. That's yeah. right. They um, they are better together. They are stronger yeah. together. But also, you've created two people whose life choices, you know, um, have put them in a place where they're not. They're they're going to realize from this from this case that their life choices were that they could change them perhaps, you know, that they'd made some choices that were not that great and maybe they now have an yes. opportunity to do something. So in its own weird way, it's kind of a coming of age novel, you know, except- uh, Yeah, it is. And coming of middle age novel is closer to the, to the whole deal. Penny has a lot, uh, um, a lot of the, the, a lot of doubts and insecurities and insects that I had at that time. But I needed, I, I basically had to push 
his success 10 years earlier, right? So when I was turning 30 and 31, I, I was writing X and I was writing three of the Marvel's top 10 selling books and, and along with three other titles and a full-time job. So I was writing six to seven monthly books for Marvel with a full-time job. Those comics were selling about 1.6, 1.7 million copies a month, every month. And, and that's as much success as anyone could have expected they could achieve in the comic book world. Right, both financially and, and in terms of output, not in terms of quality, trust me, but in terms of output. So at that age, I was asking myself, this is fantastic, this is phenomenal. What the hell do I do next? No, it's going to last forever. It's a short term wave. And I knew that. You know, the, the, the big wave was ha happening at that time in terms of sales and attention and stuff. So, what am I going to do next? And I needed, uh, Kenny came up from that insecurity one day. If you want a Pulitzer Prize in journalism during college, for a job well done, quite frankly, you know, uh, working for a college newspaper and then having mainstream newspapers want, want you to work with them to continue breaking the story. Um, he earned that Pulitzer Prize. What do you do after that if you're a journalist? <laughs> if you're a journalist and you learn a Pulitzer, it's funny too. What do you do, you know? So I tried to, I tried to just play that out with him. But, but the, initial, the initial germ of, of him was... What do I do next? Because that was what I was asking myself at that age, at that time, you know. Um, and and, and I, I played Kenny out in very different ways than, than I played my own life out, thankfully. Um, but but I, I, I needed him to start from a place of failure after having faced the success. Because that's, a, that's kind of the, the same, the, the other side of the same coin as Andrew. It is the other side, exactly. That's why they make such a good pair. Um, you know, um, you need the balance in it, but you also need their different skill sets. So it all works out. Patrick, are there any questions from the audience that you wanted to bring up? They are notably silent. Um, uh, although, although Mary says, uh, she says, I, I'm really identifying with this character. And, uh, you know, what you've just described from both of them, I think a lot, yeah, a lot of people can relate to that. You know, it's a very human attributes and that that a wide audience will relate to uh let's see what else um oh pat was asking about um i think you may have covered this but she says is this going to be a two book series and i think you've established it's going to be more than that right well we gotta we gotta see uh the, <laughs> there's the realities of business involved uh when when putnam when when we decided to go with putnam uh it, it was a two book offer and, and I've, you know, the second manuscripts in the pipeline, it's being line edited now. Um, I would like to do more. Uh, I would like to, to do spinoffs as well, because there's other things I'd like to do with some of the characters. Um, but that is always going to depend on, on how the books sell. Um, and, and I also understand that series sometimes don't explode right off the bat. You know, you have a you know, top 10 bestseller or whatever with your first book. Sometimes it takes readers a few, a few books to get into a series. So I'm hoping that, that we get that opportunity to build that story world a little bit. Um, and there's also the possibility that there will be television for, for, for the, the franchise. And if that happens, if it's still an if, but if it happens, that always helps. Uh, you know, maintain that series backlist selling uh, in, in a good way. And then Putnam knows that. So hopefully I got my fingers crossed. Um, I'm at a point right now where I'd love to start book three, but there's no contract to start book three. So I'll, I'll wait until we see where we go. What about a comic adaptation? Um, that, thank you for asking that, Patrick. That's a very interesting question. Um, I, I would, I, I have two graphic novels that I've already outlined and broken down uh, and that, that are um, the prequels that I would like to tell. And, and I'd like to do that in graphic novel format if I can. Uh, Andrea's uh, story of, of the Marana serial killer in Manhattan when she was in college and she first met Ramon. I have broken down as a graphic novel and Kenny taking down the governor of New Jersey while he was in, in his senior year in college. I have that broken down and outlined as a graphic novel. Also, if the opportunity presents itself uh, to, to work with a, a publisher uh, to do that, um, I'd be interested in pursuing it. But the honest truth is that uh, 
producing a, 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 a large body of work in comic book format uh, costs a lot of money. Uh, art and editorial costs a lot of money. So um, it, it's got a, a publisher has to be interested in, 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 in working on that. Um, so it's in my back pocket. I, I've, you know, I'm turning 60 years old this year, Patrick. It took me 25 years to write this book. I figure I, get, I got another 30, 40 years to go. I'm still good. Here's a weird, here's a weird question for you. When you were turning, you know, as we've established that the comic graphic novel form is such a part of your DNA. Um, when you turn to prose, do you think in terms of individual, you know, you, obviously it's very visual. Yeah, but. no, not, not in terms of panels. Um, what, what, I, what I definitely realized as I was working on, on Suburban Dicks, but much more so with the second book, is the second book was an easier process for me because I understood and I just understood the format better. Um, I overwrote quite a lot in the first book. We had a we had a we had to cut a lot of a lot of lot of crap <laughs> out of the manuscript from the version you're holding in your hand right now um, because I overwrote because I lacked the experience uh, to 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 understand where it needed to be tight. Um, but what the comics have really done is help me, I think, with my pacing. Um, the dialogue is, 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 is absolutely a help because you have to carry so much information and characterization out of dialogue in a comic book, but you have the visuals to help you with that. Um, but, but I've always been pretty comfortable and facile with dialogue. But as far as the, the, the comic book plotting is concerned, trans, translating that into prose benefited me to have the experience of having been a comic book writer because it really made me understand uh, Kind of just the cadence and the pace you needed to keep the story going to to not extend chapters longer than they needed to be to end chapters on hopefully the kind of a note that you want the reader to go okay i'll just read one more chapter before they turn the lights out at the end of the day um i think that the the, the cliffhanger ending aspect of comics and monthly sequential publishing where you you're, you're not literally doing a cliffhanger not every month but you always need to end your issue with the idea that you want to give your reader a reason to buy the next issue um i I actually applied that to my chapters or tried to apply that. And sometimes I realize it doesn't always click just right where the chapter ends just the way you want it to. But I think it did often enough that it gives the book uh, a feeling of momentum and, and, a, and a briskness of pace, I hope, that, that, that comes out of my experience as a comic book. Very cool. Well, I would agree with that. Um, you know, I... I... I'm such a speed reader. I read the whole book in one sitting, but um, oh, that's cool. you know, Thank I you. was um, propelled from one thing to the sheer improbability of the entire setup, you know, kept me going. I kept thinking, where is he going with this? You know, um, and, and, and I thought where you went was, I'm so sorry we can't talk about it, was really nifty. Um, so and when, I, I really did like Barbara. The, I hope I hope you have me back on for book two, and then I can talk a little bit more. We about can. <laughs> I know. Uh, Patrick, Patrick and I, if we had more time, we would love to do some follow up book club discussions because we've done a couple, and it really is nice to be able to give readers, you know, a couple months to read the book or something, and I, they come back. I know the problem is that there's always there's so many other you know, yeah. books and authors, it's really hard to try to fit them in, but um, it would it would be really rewarding if we could do it more often, I think. It, um, it would be my pleasure to come back anytime in any capacity, even well, if you have reader questions you know, afterwards, I'd be happy to answer them. What we them. could do is get together a small group of authors, you know, where, where we weren't just focused on one, we could be a little more efficient in. Yeah. In, have several authors come together and make it sort of a free for all. So we can, <laughs> we can look into that uh, for sure. Was there anything else, Pete? Nope, nothing. Nothing from the from the audience. It's interesting though. It might be fun to have somebody else um, who who also works in both fields. You know, like Brad Meltzer or um, Greg Rucka or, or you know some of the other authors that work in both. Dwayne Swarzynski, who's a good yeah. friend of mine, who does both. Um, Neil Gaiman, you know, he's got a couple of graphic novels and so. Oh, Lansdale, yeah. I mean, he yeah. does everything. Yeah, Very there's cool. a lot. There, there, there's a lot of guys. Um, Alex Segura is a friend of mine who's, yeah. who's written a lot of noir, and he 
been the head of Archie Comics for years until he just left Veroni. There, there are a lot of us. Together. We, you know, that's the great thing about Zoom is that you can actually, I mean, there are many things that are really handy about Zoom. So one is you can actually put together a group like that without worrying about travel logistics and so forth. So it is interesting how separate the two parts of the marketplace are. It, it really is. Don't you think, Barbara and Fabian? The, um, which Barbara, market, by which all two means. marketplaces do you mean, hon? The comic book world and the oh. print book world. They yeah. are very different. They really are. We, we, we have never had much success selling graphic novels, and we don't, we don't even attempt to stock comic books at the store. But there I, are I other stores. I think a lot of it is also the genre considerations, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like Neil Gaiman has had tremendous crossover from his original Sandman comic books that he right. wrote in the 90s to his novel work that that the, 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 the Sandman audience and the Sandman genre propelled him into his his, his book writing, you know, and, and obviously he's grown that audience since then. Um, but but a lot of the like like Dwayne will write a, a, a mystery novel or, or a, a hard-boiled novel but that's not necessarily the kind of comics he's writing so even yeah. with me no one no one who has known my work for 35 years is going to think that I was going to write a book about you know a 33 year old pregnant woman with with, with four kids solving a crime you know um I, I I don't I I don't know for sure yet how, how that my comic book audience throughout my career would translate to my book audience. I, 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 what I want to explore is how will my potential book audience translate to telling comic format storytelling, graphic novels in, in the book story world. If I, if, if I get three, four books and Andy's super popular, can I, can I sell a graphic novel of Andy's you know, prequel story to the poison pen audience that's buying the book. You know that that to me is where you start having opportunities to sell um, to sell comic book format material in in hardcovers and trade paperbacks because it's a genre affiliation as much as it is a creator affiliation. I wonder if a younger audience is more likely to embrace that too because you know there's a lot of fluidity I think um, yeah. in entertainment choices among the young. You know, yeah. and they're so used to, to, you know, being on their phones and playing games and doing things. I think that they're, the barriers are far less um, in transitioning from one thing to another. So we'll see. I mean, that's one thing we do, we do talk and worry about, you know, is how to get a younger audience because um, we have a more mature customer base and, you know, how do we bring in more, more young people? So try to figure out, it's been interesting since the store opened again um back in whenever it was when did we open again patrick fully in march i think it was or it was before that um whenever well we were open but not you know as open i mean we had a limited opening now we were anyway um the the children's section has just been turning over at an amazing rate and particularly yeah. on the weekends and up until covid we if we sold like five children's books a month it was going to be amazing and now mm -hmm. they're just going shh so clearly there's a new, a new reader group, you know, whether it's families, maybe there are more people living downtown. I don't know what it is. Um, oh, I wonder, that's actually curious. It just it makes me wonder if, if the year shut in, as it were, led, led to the exploration of other entertainment opportunities. Well, I think so. It may have no. been that it's, exactly. it's made kids go, you know, to, to books to a great degree and, and, you know, with movie theaters shut and, you know, yeah. the kinds of things that kids would have gone to. And certainly in adult fiction, people have been reading classics. I mean, our classic sections really been turning over and they've been reading, mm -hmm. you know, like War and Peace or things that, that you wouldn't have tackled in a busier world. So they've I've been you know, buying I've, War and Peace. We don't know if they've been. Well, that's it. true. Patrick. Good point. <laughs> they've been buying War and Peace. And all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, it'll be, I, I don't know if it was, if it's really just like pandemic. Yeah specific in that people were shut in and whether they sure. will shut all that when they can get back out again we, it's too soon to tell yeah it is what and, the, and i what certainly the hope whole it's effect not. of this is you know um i have a i have a good friend who worked he's an engineer at fender musical instruments you know they have a big a corporate office here in scottsdale and right. uh, they've had one of their biggest years ever 
you know, because I think that's it. People are, you know, buying instruments and hanging out indoors and yeah, yeah. You know, taking yeah, up. I'm, new I'm finally gonna I'm finally gonna learn how to play guitar. Right, right. exactly. It's yeah. like home entertainment. You know, if you go back to the 18th century, you know, when when children were brought up, you know, to have entertainment skills, they had to learn to play the piano and sing and play instruments and yeah. stage. You know, and people made their own entertainment. Right, and, right, and then right. we've gotten so used to outsourcing it all. That's um, a good point. Yeah. It really yeah. will be interesting yeah. to see. Uh, we're going to try to cater to all of it. I mean, we're going to stay hybrid, as I mentioned before. But then we were we were always hybrid. I mean, for 20 years, we had been videoing our live events. And then they were on live stream. And then they were on YouTube and Facebook and whatever. So it's all been kind of the same. But what's going to be interesting is to see how much of the Zoom audience will stick when we when we have more live events and how many, if we do Zoom events, whether the audience will be large or whether it will shrink because people now are doing other things. It's impossible. Hey, it's, convenient. To it's so convenient, you know, to, 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 to watch things this way, you know? You, I know, yeah. I know, but you have to be home and you, you, know, you have to be willing to do that. The reason that we are so totally opposed to ticketing events is that we feel that, that people should be able to come upon these when it's convenient for them. Yeah. I had an interesting talk to Ace with Ace Atkins about that, Patrick, and he said there's no power on earth that would make him buy a ticket to go, you know, to a book event because it might not be the right time, he might not be yeah. in the right mood, you know, whatever. But um, as long as he could come to it when it was convenient for him. So that's, that's right. the way we've operated. And you know, from a sales standpoint, our sales, I mean, we've never had anything like this year before. Our sales are just amazing. So I am firmly in the camp of um, providing the platform and letting people find it and, you know, asking them to support books. And interestingly enough, people sometimes just make donations. I mean, we enabled that. And every once in a while, you know, somebody sends us money through PayPal just saying, thanks for the videos or love the podcasts or, you know, good so work. If you enjoy the kind of quality programming that we offer, <laughs> yeah, <right>. please. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it really has been interesting, and I'll be fascinated to see how it goes. Listen, we've kept you long enough. I knew yeah. you had a very late night, and for you, it's, it's fun. Um, yeah, it's really late, and my maple pecan bourbon chicken is calling to me. So there we go. Congratulations, Patrick, chicken. and I hope the chicken came out well. Thank well, you very we'll much. Find out. Um, Suburban Dicks is a really wonderful debut novel. It is our June 1st mystery book of the month. Um, for the people who belong to our book of the month club, lucky you, you're going to get a copy. And for those who don't, we still have extra copies, thanks to Fabian's kindness. Um, and Barbara, I would can I, you to buy can one. I throw one thing out there sure. that I wasn't going to say, but I think I will. Out of the books I signed for you, there is one book that has an extra secret message in it. And Ooh. that's all I'll say. That's all I'll say. One book was given an extra secret message. Wow, it's and, like a treasure hunt. It's like and for my a my when I do that kind of thing, I always hope that it just happens organically that someone receives it. And uh, I'll do that sometimes in comic book shops. I'll sign one comic on the racks, even though the store doesn't even know who I am when I'm in there walking through the oh, store. Okay. So at some point, one customer is just going to flip through a comic book and find find the cover signed by me and then question what the heck is this? Who did this? You know, oh, but um, cool. but it's but so I did awesome. I did add a secret message in one of the copies that I sent you. So there's a unicorn. There is a yes, unicorn there is. working in one of our copies, and we're not going to open them and direct it. It's going to be completely random. But what a good idea! I love that. That is something that we should we should think about. In any case, it's been a real joy to meet you, Fabian, and a I great appreciate great the pleasure time. to it was, talk it was to you. A pleasure so, to meet you both. Thank you. Um, there will be a podcast available tomorrow, which I will send you the link and the video will live forever on our website. So any of you watching it who feel you have friends that have missed this sterling evening, um, please direct them towards the podcast or the Facebook video page because they'll have a really good time. So good night, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Fabian. Thank you, Patrick. Good night. Thank you, Barbara. Bye. Thank you, Patrick. Have a good night, everyone.